Go. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman. It's January 5th, 2022. Um, I wish you a happy new year. Uh, we're coming to you from the beautiful Seattle Science Foundation facilities at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute in Seattle, Washington. I hope you had a good turn of the year. And let's hope that these things, these masks, will be a thing of the past. Uh, today, we have uh, one of our bi-monthly features, the STED Talks, uh, the Spine Technology Education Discovery features, which uh, revolve uh, around anything not just involving the spinal column uh, from the lower cranium down through the pelvis, uh, but also the motion segments, the neural elements, the vascular elements, the psychological elements, the socioeconomic factors, whatever fancies and revolves around this amazing uh, structure that keeps us upright and allows us to function well. So this is the basic uh, element of STED Talks. And again, the D is actually a 3D discovery discussion debate. Uh, today, we have a great lecturer. Uh, we have Professor uh, Emre Ilmes from Germany. Uh, he has uh, just been freshly appointed a privat docent. That's a big step forward due to his cumulative work on pelvic fixation. This has been such a major topic for all of us. I'm going to introduce him separately uh, later in greater detail. Emery, are you with us already? Um, yes, I am, Dr. Chapman. Good morning, Emery. It's good morning. Uh, great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. And I'll again introduce you later in greater detail. As you know, we have uh, four cases selected. They weren't specifically selected for you. They're literally just cases from the more recent past. And uh, I'm looking for the first talk. Is that the Stead Talk case right here? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the one. <clears throat> As I'm pulling this up, Emery, how are things in Germany with uh, COVID restrictions? How are you doing? We are doing pretty well, I think. Um, like they started to restrict um, like a little bit uh, after Christmas and the numbers are rising currently. So the ICUs are full again. So I think there's uh, like there are more restrictions to come again. Great. So um, not good news. And we have a very similar thing here. Uh, we are back into COVID restrictions again. So I'm looking back at 2019 when you were here with us as a research fellow and we had such a great time here and uh, we're very restricted again here nationally and internationally, I think. But thank you for joining us and we'll ask you for commentary. Uh, these are all faces that you don't know anymore. Uh, Dr. Jeff Fravert will start with a recent case. And again, I'll ask you to chime in any point in time and I'll ask you probably some general questions also. So Yev, thank you for preparing this case. All right, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I'm your favorite, one of the Spine Fellows here at, uh, at Swedish. Um, uh, case in question is a 28-year-old male uh, who had a couple years of neck pain, headaches, and uh, intermittent paresthesias affecting the upper and lower extremity that were uh, maybe slightly exacerbated with, uh, uh, with neck movement. Uh, the only significant medical history for this patient is uh, uh, three years prior to presentation, uh, he had a resection uh, of his thyroid for a toxic adenoma. Uh, the patient's symptoms have been uh, slow progressive and subsequently he got imaging for which he was referred to our clinic uh, and otherwise he has no other major uh, medical or surgical history. Um, on physical exam the patient is full strength, has no formal sensory deficits although he does describe uh, occasional tingling sensations primarily affecting the, uh, the upper extremity but also occasionally the lower extremity. Uh, his neck range of motion is slightly limited and he has very mild uh, uh, midline tenderness to palpation of the, uh, of the cervical spine posteriorly. Uh, this is the uh, this is the imaging. Um... Uh, you can see a, uh, an erosive lesion primarily affecting C4, causing uh, right-sided collapse of that uh, vertebral body. Uh, the lesion doesn't seem to be <clears throat> uh, vascular. The, that uh, middle pane there is the, uh, the uh, cross-sectional uh, angiogram. Um, uh, and the lesion does, it's a little hard to appreciate on, on this imaging, but the lesion does very slightly extend into the C5 uh, vertebral body. <laughs> Uh, this is the uh, MRI. Um, lesions primarily hyper intense on uh, T2 cuts and, and uh, a little bit uh, hypo intense on uh, T1. Um, there's a mild to moderate amount of uh, spinal stenosis, uh, spinal cord stenosis right at the, uh, you know, the most uh, compressed area. 
So uh, there are a couple of considerations for uh, for this patient. Um, uh, you know, this, the differential for the lesion is pretty wide. Uh, one consideration is uh, biopsy, and then uh, you know whether or not to pursue uh, partial just decompression versus an oncologic or radical resection, uh, and then uh, subsequently the uh, extent of fusion uh, after intervention. So uh, what we elected to do was uh, we offered a C2 to T2 fusion posteriorly with a C3 to 7 laminectomy, uh, followed by uh, an anterior procedure a C4-5 uh, corpectomy. Uh, intraoperatively, we encountered uh, thin eroded bone uh, that was primarily filled with old hematoma. There were really no uh, major soft tissue components of this lesion, uh, maybe maybe some, some small tissue fragments, but nothing uh, significant. Um, uh, the intervention was, was uh, mostly uneventful, although there were some uh, engorged veins, especially uh, near the uh, uh, vertebral artery during the uh, resection of the lesion. Uh, and the patient did well. He was discharged uh, subsequently post-op day three. Uh, surgery was only um, only a few weeks ago, and he's doing well at this point. Uh, Postoperatively, this is the uh, the CT imaging. Uh, we used uh, allograft. Um, Posteriorly, uh, split thickness allograft was wired to the uh, to the spinous processes, and then anteriorly, uh, a piece of allograft was placed um, uh, in lieu of the C4-5 uh, bodies that were resected, and then another uh, another portion of the allograft was placed uh, laterally on the right side where the uh, where the lesion was previously. Uh, pathology has already come back, um, primarily consistent with an aneurysmal bone cyst. Uh, this is a relatively rare lesion. Uh, incidence is estimated to be about uh, 0.15 per uh, per million annually. Uh, it's considered non-malignant, but it can be locally aggressive, especially if it starts to, to deform the bone and in the spine cause uh, uh, instability. Um, it, it can occur in almost any bone, and about 16% of uh, these lesions occur in the spine. And uh, you know they're rare, so these numbers aren't super reliable. But uh, about 20% recur uh, after resection, uh, and they're slightly more likely to recur in children. So great stuff. Uh, can you go back to initial film? So Emery, um, this is one of those uh, bizarre cases of an unusual primary bone lesion. And uh, the question is uh, always, do we biopsy and what do we gain from a biopsy? Uh, this is a case that Dr. Skuin and I did together, and I was very appreciative to be involved in that. This is obviously a primary bone lesion. But it's notorious that we can't really get great tissue samples, especially when we have these larger cavernous lesions. So what do you teach your residents uh, in terms of biopsies when the biopsy uh, may not affect what you're doing and it also may be difficult to sample? How dogmatic are you, in other words, to get a biopsy first? Well, um, it depends on the biopsy is always great if you know what you're dealing with. Um, otherwise, if you have several other options like an MRI scan or a CAT scan, and um, it's, it's difficult. So um, as you know, like in our hospital, we don't do that much of oncological cases. We are more, like more doing the trauma stuff. But like in my opinion, you always would try to get a biopsy because if you have like um, a primary, let's say, um, a kidney tumor, uh, and that's a metastasis and that's not a primary bone tumor, then you want to know that before you start the surgery. So uh, always try to get the diagnosis before you, uh, uh, at the end, choose uh, the best treatment option. So that's my opinion. I think, yeah, that's, that's very wisely spoken. I, I think we had a pretty good understanding that this is either... Jeff, can you go through a differential diagnosis again as you see this? Uh, so, uh, uh, aneurysmal bone cyst is uh, uh, certainly one uh, possibility. This could just be uh, a post-traumatic necrosis, although the, uh, you know, the, the patient um, uh, didn't really have any clear history of trauma. Um, uh, there's, a, there's another uh, another kind of bone cyst, uh, UBC. UBC, yeah, that... Uh, unicameral, unicameral. 
the, wow, I have a U unicameral a bone cyst. Phasic attack, unicameral bone cyst. Yeah, and I believe those are even more rare than than uh, ABCs in in this region. Um, uh, and then uh, you know, much much less likely, given the imaging characteristics, this could be a sarcoma uh, of 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 any kind that's uh, uh, you know isolated to the spine. The other thing that's interesting is this kid had uh, radiation with. Um, uh, thyroid cancer. In you the know, past. yeah, I, yeah. I saw the history of, yeah. uh, of thyroid resection, but the the radiation wasn't documented. Yeah, was was that confirmed? Um, that's yeah, according to the patient. Okay. Um, so I think for us, you know, there was there was a question, a small question of whether this is like a radiation induced osteosarcoma. Um, I mean, again, intraoperatively, I think it behaved like aneurysmal bone cyst. For sure. But on the imaging, you can see, um, you know, it just kind of has a uh, funny looking appearance and it's kind of involving um, the anterior and posterior elements. So. And in anyone with a history of malignancy, yeah. you always have to consider a metastasis, although, again, the imaging characteristics here didn't really match that. Now, Rod, tell us about the retrieval artery. So, one of our concerns was that this mass had seemingly grown from the posterior elements through the lateral masses into the vertebral body of C4 specifically, but also involved C5. And uh, it engulfed the vertebral artery on the right side. So if you want to answer it directly or address it to the audience or uh, ask or interact with Yev or Emre about this, go ahead. Hi, Emre. Um, actually, you know, doing this together was very helpful because we both had different, your, your input was valuable because you wanted to go posterior first. And I think the reason for it was to, it's much easier to isolate the vert posteriorly because what you do is you find the nerve root, you trace out the nerve root and it goes right in front of the nerve root. And so we we did that, we traced it out, um, we decompressed it, and then we went um, and uh, went from the front. Um, and again, most of the lesion was on the right. So we made the incision from the left and I think they gave us a little bit more of an angle. And, and I think that helped a lot. A lot of times when you come just from the front with the tumor and you can see how dysplastic it is, it's very hard to find the vert. In fact, most of my vertebral artery injuries have been anterior, not posterior. So I think that's one, th one learning point from doing this case. And before that, we did what you have to make sure we understood vertebral artery, physiology, anatomy. What kind of imaging did we do before? Uh, you, you mean other than the, the angiogram? Yeah, we did a CT angiogram. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a CTA. That's yeah. a... Right. So can you right use there. a cursor to show where the vertebral artery would be? And sure. I don't know the healthy can... left side is and where uh, the there we go. right side so, is. So right, right there, it's a little bit hard to... Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the contrast is a little bit difficult to, uh, to appreciate, but right there at the tip of my cursor is the right-sided vert. Uh, the left-sided vert seems to be uh, pretty much uninvolved with the lesion, and it's, it's right there. But the, the vert of concern is right at the tip of the cursor. What uh, do we draw as inference from dominant versus non-dominant side? And is there a role to sacrifice or trial uh, occlude one side versus the other? So, so that's, uh, that's an area of, of some debate. So first off, uh, you know, what I was taught in residency is that uh, CT isn't, uh, or CTA rather, isn't necessarily adequate uh, to assess dominance because sometimes it can be misleading. Uh, it'll show a higher caliber vessel but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, the high flow vessel. So if you, if you really want to formally establish dominance, you, you should do a formal angiogram. The other thing that uh, a formal angiogram affords you is the ability for a balloon test occlusion uh, and potentially vertebral sacrifice if that's, uh, if that's what you want to do. Um, the, the role for vertebral sacrifice here would be if you wanted to do an on-block resection, uh, which in this region of the spine is, is you know, for obvious reasons, quite difficult. I think, um, you know, in our discussion leading up to this case, the, the imaging characteristics were sufficiently reassuring that we elected to, uh, to do this uh, piecemeal uh, rather than on block. Um, if, if we had pursued an on block resection, then, then yeah, then, then uh, uh, formal angiography with possible um, uh, endovascular sacrifice of the right side vert would have been essential to, to take this out in one piece. Great. So recurrence rate of ABCs and um, 
maybe talk about what what are the concerns in terms of the um, local uh, recurrence rates versus uh, structural failure. What what are the uh, balances in terms of radicality for section? Uh, you addressed that kind of a little bit versus yeah. Let me um, let me go to the post op restoration. So uh, I think. Um, uh, the kind of the, the numbers that are cited, and these aren't very reliable because this is such a rare pathology. Uh, it, it's it's twenty percent in adults, uh, approximately, um, but that's not really, uh, to my knowledge, uh, kind of they don't account for extent of resection or or a specific region of the of the bone cyst. I, I think in this case, uh, as long as we were able to achieve good separation of the. Um, uh, of, of whatever remaining tissue is present from the spinal cord, I think we've achieved the goal of surgery. Even if there is some kind of local recurrence, uh, it, it should be uh, relatively straightforward to re-resect that, uh, because at that point it would be, you know, very far from any uh, critical or dangerous structures. Now, this being an oncologic case, and we did not know what it was at the time, we had a strong presumption that it was going to be an ABC versus UBC versus a giant cell tumor versus fibrous dysplasia. That was our checklist, kind of. Uh, we used uh, uh, emphasized allografts. Um, uh, Emre, what is the availability of allografts in Germany these days? Is this a mainstay, or do you use mainly other forms of bioimplants? I mean, there's everything you can imagine. So everything is possible, but we also have the problems that um, like the insurance company started to not pay anymore, for example, for BNP. So you have to look if you use autograft or allografts, depending on the case. So it's getting more and more, and more difficult, more and more like in the States, probably. But do you have tissue banks? Is there like a national organized tissue bank or is it commercially organized? How do you get your allografts? No, we have a national uh, tissue base. And uh, you also have the opportunity to uh, use the femoral heads from the patient with femoral neck fractures and uh, put them into a freezer like in our hospital and use those. Great. Um, Rod, what are your thoughts? So we did, uh, I think we had four different allografts that we used in there to try to minimize metal footprint because we thought maybe if it's a giant cell, there might be a need for radiation. Uh, so what are your thoughts in terms of allografts? Why did we not put a plate on the front? Um, I think, um, you know, there was a question of whether, you know, obviously intraoperative frozen sections um, sometimes can be misleading or can come back um, uh, different than what you initially suspected. So I think, you know, for potential radiation um, and uh, artifact on imaging down the road, we try to minimize the amount of hardware that we placed. Uh, any case should always serve as a learning point. Uh, you have any thoughts reflecting back on this uh, case? Uh, you, you know, I've I've uh, only seen this pathology once before. Uh, one one thing that uh, you know struck me when I was doing the dissection was just just how. Um, uh, how little protection there was to the to the vert and the spinal cord, given how the bone had been scalloped and, and thinned out. Uh, so, so you know, during during the section, especially posteriorly, I think next time I'll take even more care to to make sure that uh, you know there's no um, electricity conducted down to the spinal cord or anything like that. Great. Well, nice job. Can you put up the next uh, presentation? And I think it's Dr. Jerry Robinson with another recent cervical spine case. Sorry, uh, Emery, we did not know um, about this. We put in just interesting cases and they're all upper cervical spine. So the opposite end of the spectrum are what you'll talk about. But this is Jerry Robinson. Jerry, can you introduce yourself? And yep, my name is Jerry Robinson. I'm one of the Swedish ortho spine fellows <clears throat> here. And uh, this is a case that we've done recently. Are the slides up? They're up on my screen. There we go. Perfect. All right. So this is a 57 year old female with an extensive smoking history, uh, COPD with recent transition to oxygen dependence. They were diagnosed about a month ago with a right upper uh, lobe adenocarcinoma confirmed on biopsy. They presented to the ED with shortness of breath and pleural effusion. They had mild neck pain with rotation and their exam was full strength, no sensory deficits, but with some mild hyperreflexia in the lower extremities. 
here you can see um, the lesion that was biopsied uh, on the axial as well as their large pleural fusion that was drained. On routine imaging at that point in time in the ER as well, a cervical spine CT was obtained. And here you can see uh, very severe degenerative changes at the C12 joint, as well as possible old fracture or um, a potential os that has uh, become degenerate. And you can also see the uh, severe arthrosis of the C12 joint on those laterals and the very severe compression of the uh, cervical spine uh, high up in the cord. So uh, did you talk about the oncologic comorbidity? Uh, yeah, I talked just now briefly about how that she had uh, lung cancer newly diagnosed a month ago, has not started any formal chemo or any potential resection uh, options. Um, and so we have this kind of window of time here. It was determined at this point in time, an MRI was ordered and the MRI with and without contrast revealed uh, a similar uh, story as the CT, severe compression uh, with a previous either fracture or uh, os uh, that's severely degenerated and severe uh, high cervical spine cord uh, signal lesion within the cord as well. I don't think this is an osodontoidium. I think that this okay. is a uh, odontoid fracture malunion. Gotcha. And she does have that history of uh, when she was like 16 to 18 years old being treated in traction for a femur fracture and possibly had neck pain at that point. But was never diagnosed with any formal odontoid fracture. So um, the question is, what's the plan at this point? So yeah. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, welcome Fotis. Um, Fotis, you had a question about the previous case. It was an ultrasonic scalpel used for dissection? Uh, maybe Dr. Skuin can address if we did this dissection together. Why would you not use an ultrasonic dissector? De definitely not. Um, you know, it's just it's very difficult to the uh, anatomy was very distorted. Um, so we just went, you know, millimeter by millimeter with kerosene and carefully um, dissected the uh, tumor off the vertebral body. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. Um, we actually, uh, we went for a very wide resection. As you can see on the post-operative CT scan, we had a small amount of bone left behind despite doing an intraoperative 3D CT. Um, uh, but we did not go for radicality. Intraoperative pathology was reassuring that we're not dealing with a sarcoma or a carcinoma. Uh, so that was good. But um, again, we actually, uh, we just took our time and we dissected out the vertebral artery and the nerve roots, right, Rod? And yeah. I don't know that we would have gained anything with uh, like an ultrasonic dissector. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it was very difficult because as you saw, it was like, the tumor was very difficult to um, uh, differentiate from like the normal soft tissue. And so we just kind of care. In fact, there was like almost like a, um, it was like a cystic component to it. So there really wasn't a lot to drill. We just kind of carefully pulled the soft tissue off the vertebral artery. So Emre, um, <clears throat> big time uh, uh, smoker, long-term smoker. Uh, tell us about lung cancers. Uh, for a long time, this was a death sentence for patients until the more recent past. Nowadays, many of those, not all of them, can be actually treated very well with immunotherapies. How has the perception of lung cancers, metastatic lung cancers, changed in Germany? Has that, uh, because you have so many smokers, I assume you have still a fairly sizable lung cancer population. That's true. Um, I think there are a lot of things changing right now, especially uh, I don't uh, I don't know if you're like um, in the US uh, have heard like about the hype with BioNTech in terms of not in terms of the vaccination, but like basically they are trying to um, heal cancer patients and uh, using antibodies, specific antibodies. And so like right now, when you have like a patient with um, such uh, that one in the case uh, with a adenocarcinoma in, in, the, in the lungs, like they can easily live like for five years or longer, depending on the grading. So there are a lot of things happening and changing. So this is a very unusual case. She had a femur fracture treated non-surgically in traction for like three months uh, as a young woman. And she probably unbeknownst to herself had an odontoid fracture during this severe car crash. And this just healed in this malposition. 
Now we have a, a patient who faces um, surgery, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, and immunotherapy uh, for her lung cancer. She has uh, been staged. There's no other disease anywhere outside of her lungs, so this is not a metastatic lesion. And she is left with a very, very nasty-looking uh, neuroimaging study. Jerry, what was her cord diameter, the actual sagittal, mid-sagittal cord diameter? Remember that? I, re I recorded it somewhere. Uh, I th it was very small. I mean, it was, it was like less 4 than four millimeters. millimeters. Yeah, so it was around like 4, four maybe millimeters. less, depending on how you move the uh, cursor. And she has cord signal changes. So we have a very precarious looking cord. She has these weird periods of kind of not breathing. Do you remember what that's called, Jerry? Yeah, uh, I can give a little brief on it. On Dean's curse. Yeah, tell us a brief on it. So essentially there was a, um, in the mythology, there was this nymph or, or water nymph that fell in love with a man married him and had a child and then eventually was betrayed. And so she cursed him that whenever he would fall asleep, he would forget to breathe. And so he had to stay awake to recall how to breathe. And so that's kind of the, the legend behind it. But another name would be like central hypoventilation syndrome. So you lose why your drive. What, what, what structure gets impaired in this particular high cord compression? So the, the respiratory uh, drive center in like the brainstem or the upper C-spine uh, becomes compressed and uh, you lose your drive to breathe. Yeah, so this is Undine's curse. So when your residents fall asleep in your meetings, Emma, in the future, you can uh, give them Undine's curse, okay? Okay. <laughs> so um, you have a small window to do something for this patient due to her oncologic disease. Uh, the question again is when, where, what do you want to do? Um, uh, do you kind of pursue oncologic care? Uh, say, again, had nothing done yet. Uh, or do you kind of fix the spine and get her moving? And if you want to fix the spine, how much do you do? Do you want to change the deformity? Uh, so what are your general thoughts, Emery? How much should you do in this kind of a crazy circumstance of late missed spine trauma, and now you have to deal with the tumor also? I mean, I don't think that the um, non-union in uh, of the odontoid is like the major problem because that is something she had like for a couple of years already, but the tumor mass. So I would first start and talk with the oncologist in terms of, is he expecting that uh, a radiation or a chemotherapy uh, would like get any would be beneficial in terms of like decreasing the volume of the tumor so that it might be get easier to do surgery. I want. Um, was she neurological intact? Is that correct? Jerry, what's your thoughts? What's yeah, so we had actually multiple fellows see her uh, because it was kind of very difficult to believe that she was such high functioning. She uh, was an entrepreneur and owned a tree trimming business. Uh, surprisingly, it was not ataxic, had good function of her hands, but uh, was somewhat hyperreflexic and had brisk reflexes. So we had a long uh, shared informed decision making conversation with the patient about how to proceed. Just to clarify, the MRI does not show tumor mass in the cervical spine. The, the only isolated lesion was in the lung and her oncologist was in the um, stage of uh, immuno characterizing the tumors and determining chemotherapy and immunotherapy regimens. And they it determined her prognosis to be fairly good, depending on the response, anywhere from five to 10 years. So, yeah, so we have a window there, Emery. So what are your thoughts then? Okay, uh, then I misunderstood the case. I thought there's a tumor mass in the upper cervical spine as well. So in that case, um, um, with a signal in the uh, spinal cord, you have to operate on her. I mean, you you basically have the option to decompress her, to do the OCF, or occip uh, occipital cervical fusion. That will be like my first thoughts. So yeah, why don't you go ahead, uh, Rod, uh, if you go forward, uh, would you basically want to go anteriorly also? A lot of surgeons, when we present this case, said, oh, you have to go transoral, you have to decompress that old odontoid malleon, and we evidently didn't do that. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? I think um, this is uh, exactly what I would have done. I don't think you're going to gain anything by going in the front. Yeah, so this uh, case is really cool. We did this recently, occiput fusion to C5 with decompression, uh, Lamy at C1, and also a, a portion of the skull base. Uh, the patient did extremely well, um, didn't have her normal rotation or uh, neck range of motion pain compared to preoperatively and was discharged on day two. 
and remain neurologically intact. So yeah, um, and you have a post office CT scan. Again, we used allograft as a structural allograft. We decided to not go anteriorly because this patient again will need all her um, all her capacity. She's neurologically literally intact. We we uh, still called her a neuric zero. I think neuric one maybe, uh, but she uh, was remarkably normal despite the impressive CT scan. So. Uh, but we felt that uh, this is the best time to do the surgery um, before she started all of her various regimens for her lung cancer. The oncologists were very confident that they could give her a couple of years at least we, to be seen. But so we used this, and she actually was just in the hospital for about two days. Emery, since you've seen the U.S. also and are back in Germany now, is uh, just talk about length of stay. This patient was in the hospital for basically two days and after pretty major surgery, which you tolerate well with minimal blood loss, uh, how long do German patients expect to be in a hospital? I think after such an operation, it would be something between five and 10 days. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think we have any patient with an OCF uh, who has been discharged after two days. That's like literally not happening in Germany for a lot of reasons. As you see what we did, what would you have done, hypothetically? What would you have recommended? Like in terms of the discharge or uh, surgery-wise? Yeah. Good, good of you to clarify. Yeah, I mean, like surgery-wise would be the same thing. I think it's, it's. I don't have, I don't see the, the benefit from going to, from anterior. I wouldn't have addressed the malunion of the odontoid. I've done, a, I would have done a decompression and OCF. I think that's the most reasonable way to do that, to handle that. So uh, you're a member of the oldest uh, established trauma center in the world in Bochum, uh, which is a very cool uh, distinction. Uh, tell us about trauma care. Has, is there any role for plain x-rays anymore in trauma care? Has everything gone to CTs? Not everything, but mainly like uh, especially with spinal trauma, especially the upper cervical spine, you need a CT scan. So like if you get a head CT for whatever clinical reasons, you add a C spine CT right away. Yeah, in most of the cases, especially when you have old patients where after ground level fall, they usually have like some kind of um, uh, blood thinner. So you usually do a CT scan of the head and the upper cervical spine as well. Jerry, talk to us about any learning points. What, what struck you in this case as you reflect back? Yeah, so if you look at the um, CT scan, I remember discussing this case preoperatively about do you, do you fuse this where it lies? And you can kind of see our lateral mass trajectory there. And so it was a good opportunity to get some very strong fixation with almost like a transarticular screw there. Um, we had a, a very nice bony corridor and you can see the left lateral mass is almost as, I mean, it's essentially fused to C1 and C, C2 are fused together. So, uh, I think that was a good opportunity for that. And then also, I think the, the learning point of having a very strong shared informed decision-making with the patient who, you know, despite having lack of symptoms, had a very at-risk cord and, you know, one fall and, and she might be vent ventilator dependent. And then also, um, the discussion of anterior with the other colleagues we had about, you know, this is a lung patient, uh, lung cancer patient that just stopped smoking about a month ago. I think that an anterior based procedure, transoral or, or even endoscopic would be fraught with complications, especially in a smoker with lung cancer. Yeah, I was surprised when we reviewed this in our internal case conferences, there were a fair number of colleagues who felt strongly about going from the front in one way or another, submandibular approach, this or that. I mean, this is a patient who's facing tumor care. I was surprised about that. Were you too, Rod? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think this is uh, chronic. It's been there for a long time. You know, uh, I think decompression, stabilization, posterior is the way to go. Great. Well, thank you for the nice presentation, Jerry. I think we have Dr. Nathan Pratt next. Did you guys take any of the posterior fossa off? It looked like yeah, we actually did a sub. Um, uh, we did a nice little suboccipital decompression right. also. So we widened the frame and magnum. We took off the C1 arch wide, and we waited for the core to re-expand. We did this under the usual elevated maps, so minuterial pressures wow. were elevated. And went actually very smoothly. And uh, uh, Jerry and Yev did a very nice job dissecting uh, this. So it was very clean. 
Dr. Nathan Pratt, good morning. Good morning, Happy everybody. Good to you. Nice Hi to there. see you again. Yes, sir. Good you can take you. your mask off if oh, you're comfortable yeah, for the let's, presentation. Let's make it easier. That's, uh, I will mask up again in a second, but All right. thanks for putting That's some good. cases together that you involved oh, no with just problem. last week. Yeah, these are cases from this weekend, actually. I'm Nathan Pratt. As Dr. Chapman said, I uh, am one of the other minimally invasive and complex spine fellows here. I uh, trained at University of Maryland previously in neurosurgery. So... Um, our case here, this is a 76 year old who presented uh, with a history of a T8 hemangioma that was partially resected and then kyphoplasty and then treated with cyber knife about 15 years prior to presentation. He was sent to uh, one of our vascular colleagues clinic with a three month history of worsening myelopathy and ambulatory dysfunction with just a CT image. Uh, so we'll look at that in a sec. He had, other than this uh, this thoracic laminectomy with uh, kyphoplasty, subsequent kyphoplasty back in 06, no other significant surgical history. Um, and he's otherwise a physically active person uh, for, for 76, for sure, who gets up, walks around, uh, and tries go, go to back. be very active. Well, One so. question. Cyber knife sounds really cool. Tell us what that the is. The same as gamma knife, and this is radio, radio surgery, so, or, or essentially similar to gamma knife. Uh, radio surgery, so uh, very targeted uh, surgical therapy, multiple beams of radiation right to one spot to avoid uh, injury to the spinal cord. Uh, newer techniques like proton beam as well, things like that that avoid injury to nearby structures, uh, commonly used. I mean, intracranially in like schwannomas and things like vestibular schwannomas, things like that. any tumor or lesion that you don't want to have radiation get to nearby tissues. Uh, it, it, it's a very nice technique. Um, on physical examination, uh, he had some diffuse weakness uh, in his lower extremities. So this is part of why he was unable to ambulate. Um, worse in sort of his distal lower extremities than proximal. Um, hyperreflexic in the lower extremities uh, with a um, uh, Babinski reflex up going uh, toes bilaterally. Um, prior surgical incision well here he had sort of normal bulk and tone had no urinary retention so here's the ct this is all he was sent to clinic with initially um with evidence of a uh, erosive lesion both at that's up at t3 and then this is at t8 uh with the kyphoplasty cement in place and with a really a partial laminectomy don't know if there's some over overgrowth of that facet uh, afterward, uh, or if there's some tumor that's invaded, or sorry, hemangioma that's invaded up there as well. So immediately obtained an MRI, which showed uh, significantly more um, overgrowth than uh, was noted on the CT, which is not uh, unexpected at this point. Um, so because of this, the patient was urgently admitted from clinic. He'd been progressively worsening relatively quickly. Uh, because of the vascular nature of this type of lesion, uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Temchuk, did a uh, embolization uh, of the uh, left side, or sorry, the right side of the, uh, so no, that is the left side of the lesion. Um, it, is, it is oriented properly. Um, and with successful uh, um, you know, embolization of this uh, vascular pedicle with onyx um, and was planned for a Kind of extensive fusion because we wanted to include that other area of hemangioma at T3 being concerned that if we fuse sort of up toward that uh, but didn't include it he might have a significant amount of kyphosis over the top of that at some point um, and then decompress him from uh, T7 to the upper part of uh, uh, T9 uh, and perform a corpectomy there at T8 um, and so yeah to include the, uh, the uh, region of the other um, hemangioma. So tell us about hemangiomas again. So this is something that is usually felt to be, quote, benign. Yeah. Yes, now, sir. this is not a malignant deterioration. Correct. This is a locally aggressive uh, exacerbation. Right. Tell us about what to look for when you look at a hemangioma, what's worrisome, what's not, and why do some just locally decompensate like this? I'm not sure why some of them decompensate. I know that there are a number of signaling pathways that are involved in the growth of hemangiomas, cavernous angiomas, things like that, which have some similar properties to them. Um, and what is, I mean, anytime you have a significant amount of soft tissue invasion of the lesion, uh, that becomes concerning. Again, normally this is sort of, oftentimes it's found when it's still contained within a bone. That's obviously easier to deal with. Most of these that are found are, are found 
incidentally on an MRI performed for some other reason, uh, which is true for most spinal lesions at this point. Um, and so uh, aggressive features like this where uh, it's extended into the canal, into the soft tissues uh, beyond that uh, are certainly concerning. And you're correct, it, this does not, in general, this does not metastasize to other regions. It doesn't, um, you know, present like that. So it, usually um, it's just aggressive local growth. Uh, if, if it is completely resected or, or even, you know, for the vast majority of it resected, it doesn't usually recur. And it's super surprising it recurred after uh, radiation as well. So uh, a very, um, a very interesting uh, presentation for the patient. So the patient did well? Yeah, the patient is doing very well. Uh, this is his post-operative CT. Um, you can see we left a little bit of the anterior portion of the vertebral body. There wasn't any tumor or, sorry, hemangioma in that. Um, and the bone at that, at that end plate had been completely eroded at T7. Um, so we were very happy uh, with the placement of the graft. The patient now is already in the acute rehab unit here. He's post-op day. Uh, Post-op day one, he was in the ICU. He was there for a few days because of some uh, hypotension. Uh, it was probably due to blood loss. This is a, as, as everyone knows, this is a very bloody uh, lesion. Uh, we lost uh, almost three and a half liters. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of blood. We lost very little dissecting it out. It's just as soon as we got into it, it was uh, very difficult to control. Uh, there, there, there wasn't really, uh, until we got most of it out, um, there was nothing we could do. And this is typical for these or for bloody tumors, same way. Uh, until you get the lesion out, it, it's just gonna continue to bleed. One of the things that I remember Howard Eisenberg telling me it's gonna bleed until we get it out of there. Um, so- uh, Can you use had, a cell saver when you- No, the so that's, that's a very good point. And we couldn't mm -hmm. use that. We did use um, uh, 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 a uh, anti-thrombolytic, but we did not use uh, cell saver for the case, the theoretical risk of embolizing the lesion elsewhere into the body is too great. This is not used in infection cases, in tumor cases, in what we call locally aggressive lesion. I don't know if you call uh, a hemangioma a tumor, but uh, similarly, anytime you're concerned about uh, a lesion like that, you don't want to use the cell saver uh, or any, uh, the, the brand name, any other sort of uh, reuse of uh, auto transfusion from the sur surgical field. Additionally, uh, I did not mention, uh, we harvested iliac crest graft. We did that and in the next case we'll show because we didn't feel the use of BMP would be appropriate at all. Uh, there's some uh, evidence to suggest BMP is involved in the signaling pathway that helps to uh, propagate these lesions. So we didn't use that. Um, and so a, a little bit of both some, some of the structural uh, uh, autograph was placed into the uh, cavity as well, and then used to help encourage arthrodesis, particularly given the patient had relatively poor bone quality. Um, and, and so that, that was used to augment the, uh, the fusion. So Dr. Um, Ufanula Shah, I want to shout out to you. You've been a frequent visitor and a viewer. Thank you for your interest and your great questions today. Mm -hmm. He had some quick questions uh, uh, about the previous case, but let me ask about this one. So mm -hmm. thoracic hemangioma, what criteria were applied to decide the extent of the construct? So why would you do what? Yeah, so the reason that we went was? higher than, I mean, I think most people would have said, you know, three up, three down, uh, or two up, two down, just depending on what your preferences would be reasonable. If we had gone, uh, because obviously part of that, can you see this? Oh yeah, it, this was partially eroded at uh, uh, T7 as well. So six and five would have been included. The concern that we had was, is, is this lesion at T3 going to become more erosive at some points, another hemangioma? Um, is it going to become more erosive and cause uh, kyphotic deformity at that level? That's the only reason we extended up it as high as we did because of rigid moment arm below that. Uh, obviously it's in the thoracic spine, it's relatively stable, um, but what we wanted to avoid was having to come back for an additional operation, a patient who's 76. And the loss of motion by fusing, you know, a few more segments in the thoracic spine is basically nil. Um, it's just a little bit more exposure. Um, so that, that was the, 
we, we thought that the benefit of doing that will significantly outweigh the um, sort of the risk to the patient, which was sort of minimal in this case. Great. Yep. Any thoughts, Emily, on this case? Hemangiomas are so common. Um, uh, pardon? Uh, yeah, Post op, uh, not yet. No, no. Uh, pre op. Oh, pre op. Yeah, um, it's right here. So this is one of those crazy it's things. This was really obviously bad. a locally aggressive lesion. Um, do your radiologists kind of have a messaging system to your uh, very busy center so that you kind of get notified about problem readings? How does that work from a messaging standpoint at a large university hospital like yours? They basically call you. Um, so if the radiologist, radiologist sees uh, such a lesion, they always call you. And, but I have another question. Do you use in such a case where you might expect a major bleeding, uh, tranexamic acid? Yes. Was that? That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. antithrombolytic, yes. Okay. Yes. Have you had a blood bank shortage in Germany uh, as well? We have had this an ongoing as an ongoing problem, and our uh, various um, uh, national, federal, and states uh, uh, institutions still struggle with getting the blood supplies up to par. Has that been a problem in Germany? Um, actually, it is. Like since uh, COVID, like uh, we have much less. Um, blood supplies uh, and so we have a huge debate ongoing about bleeding um, uh, how much blood you have to give preoperative leave sometimes uh, do you use tranexamic acid because the anesthesiologists they don't really like that they like that in like uh, really pol poly traumatized patients but like when you're like before a major surgery like a hip arthroplasty or a spine or a pelvic case and they, the anesthesiologists, they always uh, aware of or afraid of uh, a deep vein thrombosis and a lung embolism. And on the other hand, the surgeons doesn't want the, um, the operation site uh, to be bleeding that much. So it's like, there's an ongoing debate about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've just been amazed that this has not been a target or focus of uh, the federal uh, healthcare bureaucracies. It's uh, really a, a very major, one of those many things in this COVID crisis that nobody anticipated mm -hmm. or could have anticipated, but hasn't done anything about. It's kind of frustrating. I find it's pretty easy here to get the TXA going. Like TXA I think our easy. anesthesiologists are pretty willing to do yeah. it. I mean, I know different institutions have different practices, but yeah, blood products are a huge issue. I mean, the, we had enough PRBCs for this case, but there are only a few units of platelets. So if you run into an MTE situation where you really need to be matching platelets, FFP, and uh, PRVCs, that's when I think you run into trouble. There's only three bags of them. I mean, again, it's not you're not going to bleed that much, but a chance that, um, that you could run into trouble with that. Um, so one second. So Dr. Suslian has a very good question. Fotis, um, and this goes to Emre. Um, he asked about the use of P15 peptide. It's also known as I-factor. Um, oh. Uh, as an osteobiologic, uh, since this may create secondary osteoinduction. So first of all, Emre, this is a pretty expensive um, uh, subprotein in the osteoinduction chain. It's being marketed here as a substitute to BMP. Um, do you use this in Germany? Have you seen this? I've seen that. I know some of the spine units are using it, but we don't use it at all, like yeah. zero. It's too it's expensive. Like, also. Too expensive, and um, uh, let's say a debatable outcome. I don't know if there's a huge benefit for the patient if you use that. There might be in some, but there's not much literature about like really showing that. Yeah, I was involved actually in the I Factor FDA trials when they did it at Harborview uh, as one of the test sites for ACDFs. And again, I'm not sure this is a great uh, subject matter because ACDFs can heal pretty well. Uh, so there they showed uh, actually uh, equivalency only. Uh, the company was then uh, kind of bought up by a much larger outfit that then went for a major lumbar trial. We were part of the lumbar trial also. Mm -hmm. And the results are still pending on that. It's been like two or three years in the running now and we've stopped enrolling. We're doing the long-term follow-up. So I'd be curious to see what happens. The actual evidence is not that clear. So for this, my, from my viewpoint, 
uh, the price point is pretty steep for what this is. This is, uh, again, a, a sub-factor in the overall cascade, and I'm not sure that this is truly as evidence-based, but you're quite right, since it uh, basically does not go into the genetics of bone healing as bone morphogenic protein does, it would be of interest. So let's stay tuned on this. But right now, uh, we simply don't have it available because the company has... Uh, reached for the st stars in their pricing and osteobiologics are getting heavily regulated. <clears throat> yeah, I think I've used that like two or three times at Maryland, not, not very commonly used for us either. All right, so another uh, interesting thoracic case. Uh, we have a 60-year-old woman with a uh, T4 spinal lesion uh, admitted through the emergency department, has sensory disturbances in her lower extremities, worsening ambulatory dysfunction. Uh, and this person has been extremely physically active. She goes to dance classes as issue for a 40 year old. She looks like her 60 year old. She looks like she's 40 um, reports some pain in the left chest uh, as well. Um, no history of malignancy, no history of unexpected weight loss and some early symptoms of cell anesthesia or, or hypesthesia really, uh, which is sort of in keeping with the diffuse hypesthesia she feels from the lower thoracic region all the way down to her feet. Uh, past medical history is sort of unremarkable, had asthma. Um, she did have uh, ACL repair in the past. Uh, otherwise, there's not much uh, in her past surgical history or uh, any of her other sort of uh, social issues. She's a, a non-smoker. Uh, so the mild hypesthesia that she reports, she has no bowel or bladder incontinence. Uh, the rectal exam was not performed in this case. She had full strength everywhere. Uh, throughout her upper and lower extremity. She had hyper reflex or increased reflexes, both patella and the ankle, uh, had some, uh, uh, um, um, sorry, beats of clonus, but not sustained, and then had upgoing uh, toes bilaterally. So this is the MRI that was obtained in the emergency department showing a, as a T2 weighted MRI, I don't have the T1 post, but it is also, uh, it does gadolinium enhance. It is hyper hypo intense on T1 and hyper intense after gadolinium administration. This is a T2 weighted MRI showing a uh, hyper intense uh, lesion invading uh, the vertebral body, invading the neuroforamen uh, on the left side. And uh, I think one of the things we wanted to note, um, this was a multiple multidisciplinary surgery. I don't know how well it shows up here, but the aorta is right here. Um, the esophagus is sitting, it's hard for me to see if I'm in the right spot or not, but the esophagus is sitting just uh, ventral to this, the sort of most ventral portion of the tumor. And then the uh, aorta is obviously just lateral to it. Um, so an invasive lesion into the thoracic cavity, but without violation, of, without clear violation of the pleura on the imaging. So one question that I always have is, what's the margination look like? What can we gather as an information from the zone of contact between the neoplasm and the host uh, tissues? Um, trying to figure is out- Is it what... infiltrative? Is it marginated, et cetera? So, mar so it looks like there's a reasonable capsule around this lesion. Um, I know that it invades into the bone um, but even that has some encapsulation to it. It doesn't appear to sort of uh, locally invade the tissues. It expands the uh, neuroforamen at that level, but doesn't necessarily invade into, I mean, it destroyed the pedicle. Um, but it's not invading into the pleural cavity. It hasn't eroded that. Um, it, it's sort of just growing and expanding and pushing everything aside rather than um, actually invading most of the tissues that are there. So the age-old question emerges. So here we have a patient who's myelopathic. Mm -hmm. um, this is a pretty compromised cord. She actually has an amazing functional preservation considering that this is like just above the watershed zone of the thoracic spinal cord. But getting worse quickly. So do you get a biopsy first and do you wait then for the usual? Emery, how long does it take uh, for a biopsy uh, to come back if it's not a very clear pathology? I think it would take at least five days. Bingo. This is, uh, I'm glad to see that we're not behind the eight ball. It's amazing yeah. to me. Again, they have so much to do nowadays. It's not that they're lazy. They have yeah. so many yeah. protein assays to run and spectrographies and 
uh, immune stains. So mm-hmm. it's it's not a straightforward thing anymore. Yes. It's not a microscope and ah, this is this. Exactly. So exactly. so here you have a compromised patient, and again, you need to operate. Um, uh, this patient, I assume, was staged throughout, so from brain through spinal. Yeah, axis. so I was going to mention that we did CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, negative, no malignancy anywhere, nothing else that, that lit up on that. Panneraxis MRI, completely normal. Nothing else in her entire body that that we sort of could identify. And you talk about gadolinium contrast. Is it necessary to have gadolinium contrast? Let's say this patient would have, she didn't, but would have uh, kidney disease or anything like that. Do you have to have gadolinium contrast? No, not in that case. I mean, you you can't, if you can't do it, you can't do it. I mean, a lot of the times, but I prefer it for sure. And even in patients with mild or moderate renal dysfunction, the risk of that systemic fibrosis they worry about from gadolinium is nearly nil. Um, at Maryland, I know that there were a lot of renally compromised patients that they would argue with us a little bit about, but as long as radiology approved it, they would go ahead and administer contrast. They'd Rod, what are your thoughts? Really uh, aggressive surgery, excisional uh, management, intraoperative biopsy, uh, preoperative biopsy in a patient who is starting to decline? I mean, I think <clears throat> they're, uh, they neurology is important, right? So I think you guys did the right thing. I think if you yeah. don't do anything, the patient's going to become paralyzed. Yeah. We, we considered yeah. biopsying first. That was something that we definitely thought about because of the obvious benefit if this yeah. turned out to be, I mean, the differential on this is extremely broad, right? Everything from a benign tumor like a schwannoma or something like that, all the way up to a chordoma. I mean, you just don't know what this is going to be. What um, was the final? Well, we don't have final path yet. We do have prelim, which was a uh, spindle cell lesion without malignant features. Mm-hmm. So potentially a schwannoma. That would be great. Great. Wow. Um, but so we a need to come to a conclusion. So carry yeah, on. sorry, I, I've, no, no, I've jumped far point. ahead. One of the reasons that we thought, looking at this with Dr. Hart, we, we, we thought, well, one of the reasons she's not so compromised in terms of neurologic function is this eroded through the bone. Um, and so it, it, it didn't compress as much as it would have had it uh, not expanded the... Um, sort of the canal that it could grow into. So uh, that, that was fortunate for the patient. Um, and we already discussed all of this. So we planned for a T2 to T7 uh, fusion decompression T3 to the uh, sort of the top T5. T4 corpectomy planned for possible vertebrectomy, depending on what we ran into. It would have been potentially something we could do. Because of that proximity that we noted to the um, aorta and the esophagus and, and the pleural space. We have both a cardiac surgeon and a uh, thoracic surgeon available, both of whom uh, scrubbed in briefly just to look at things, but we didn't really have, uh, uh, we weren't, thankfully we didn't need them for the surgery. We didn't run into any trouble, but um, certainly we had that option available to us. Um, so everything went well in the operation. Actually, EBL was very low, about 500 cc's uh, to maybe uh, 750 in this case compared to the other one. Not a super bloody lesion. Uh, we once we get the biopsy back, or the sorry, the frozen back, saying this looked like it did not have malignant features. We went ahead and resected intralesionally. Um, we did the fusion as described, decompressed uh, as described, and harvested um, a. Uh, femoral, or sorry, a, uh, not femoral, a uh, iliac crest graft again, uh, an autograft uh, for the same reasons, not able to use BMP in this type of case. We were initially thinking we would do a full corpectomy and place a corpectomy cage, but because the anterior column didn't appear to be that unstable, we were able to leave bone because we had a good margin. The lesion was all out. Uh, we thought that it was probably safe to leave that and place uh, instead a small piece of structural um, graph from the iliac crest uh, to allow better visualization on post-operative MRI because this may need to be radiated in the future. So this is, um, uh, she also had a very good outcome. We mentioned the uh, lesion uh, pathology, or at least the prelim. We don't have the final back yet. This was done on Saturday, I think. I think we did this one Saturday. Uh, so it'll be another, probably by the end of the week, we'll have final um, she was in the ICU overnight, but didn't even really need that. Just, just close observation. And she's still on the floor, but she already feels better. Lower extremities have a little increased sensation. Uh, she doesn't have any of the pain that she had had sort of radiating into the chest. And, uh, she's currently awaiting, actually, she's not awaiting. I think she's going to be able to go home. So, um, 
She looks really good. It's, this has gone well. Super. Nice presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, I'll come guys. up again. <clears throat> So Emery, any thoughts on uh, these last two cases? Uh, they're both kind of unusual uh, neoplastic uh, diseases. That, that's true. I, I think that like those uh, kind of cases, you really need a multidisciplinary approach. Like when you're like in a small hospital and you don't have a, a cardiac surgeon, a thoracic surgeon, I think that's like are not the case you should do there. You really need a big institute and uh, to handle those cases as well. So today we have the great honor of introducing Professor Emery Ilmas. Uh, he recently was appointed to be a Privatdozent um, in the German academic system. That means he is uh, heavily focused on one topic, and it's great to have him with our Stead Talk Spine Technology Education Discovery and debate. Um, and again, today we have optimizing pelvic fixation. About uh, uh, Dr. Ilmas, he is now an Oberarzt and a Privatdozent. Uh, um, he is at the oldest trauma hospital in the world, the BJU Berufsgenossenschaftliche Unfallklinik. That's a mouthful. It was built for coal miners, and that's where it got its uh, pedigree from. At, uh, in Bochum, he's going to say something about that. Um, I've been so impressed with him. He was a past research fellow here with us. And I uh, spent a year with us and he was so productive. He actually won the reviewer of the year award twice, not once for Global Spine Journal. And uh, he's become very popular with um, uh, very major people around the world. So this is uh, Martha uh, Kirchner from Quito, Ecuador, and so the famous Mr. John Webb, who was one of the true pioneers of modern day deformity and trauma surgery. All oh, those both colleagues so much. And uh, again, he's also uh, been with Alex von Glinsky here as one of our group pictures with our partner, Dr. Amir Abdul-Jabbar. And he's been always very well-dressed and very popular with uh, the ladies. And um, he's a, a phenomenally productive colleague. He now has over 80 peer-reviewed uh, publications out. And again, one of his main foci for his award to get uh, appointed to Privatdozent was his work on uh, pelvic fixation, which has become a global uh, feature for deformity surgery and complex lumbar surgery. So without much further ado, I want to ask Emery to kind of update us and give us a synopsis of what led to his uh, uh, award, which just happened, I think, a month ago. So congratulations against Emery. Happy New Year from us here in Seattle to Bochum. And we're curious to hear your synopsis of your work on pelvic fixation, uh, reality and myths and where to go. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to give this talk about pelvic fixations and we focus over the evolution and uh, a possible outlook into the future. I have no disclosures. And as already mentioned by Dr. Chapman, I'm from the Northwestern Germany, uh, from the city in Bochum where I'm currently living and working. And this area was very famous for coal mining back in the days. And as you all might know, this was a very risky job and which leads to the first established specialized emergency and trauma hospital in the world founded in 1890. And why are pelvic fixation techniques important? They are important because I think regardless what kind of technique you are crying or construct you are uh, trying to create or what kind of um, technique you are using, um, you need a solid foundation. And uh, when it comes to spine, the foundation is at the bottom. So the keystone biomechanically is the sacrum. And that's why it's so important. So, but let's start at the beginning. The beginning is uh, LB and hips in the early 20th century. They were the first to um, describe the spinal athletesis, including the lumbosacral fusion. After that, Harrington established the Harrington rods using hooks. And later on, um, Eduardo Luke uh, described the segmental instrumentation and which was then uh, combined by Cottrell and Debussy in the 80s and they used hooks and the segmental instrumentation. Later on, the first pelvic 
Um, fixation was described by Alan Ferguson, the Galveston technique, which incorporated uh, the ilium into the uh, spinal instrumentation. Since then, a lot of different techniques have been described, like sacral plates and bars, transiliac bars, the lumbopelvic fixation, the S2AI screw technique, the minimal invasive iliosacral screw technique, and the dual or multiple screw technique. And in my opinion, like those four techniques, the lumbopelvic fixation technique, the S2AI, the minimal invasive iliosacral screw technique, and the dual or multiple screw construct are like, for me, the, mo the four most important technique when it comes to pelvic fixation. Indications range from unstable posterior ring fracture, sacral fracture, sacral fixation in patients with osteoporosis, high-grade spondylolisthesis, resection of sacral tumors, infections uh, with bony destructions, long fusions to the sacrum, and revision, revision surgeries like uh, non-unions, etc. Let's start with the lumbopelvic fixation. Um, my boss here in Germany and Dr. Chapman as well, they did a, little, a lot of research on this uh, at Harborview. This is one of their landmark papers but, uh, describing the anatomic and radiographic uh, considerations for placing the iliac screws. They were able to show that the trajectory from the PSIS to the AIS is still the gold standard providing the longest bony canal and uh, it would uh, easily fit uh, uh, up to 140 millimeter screw in males or 130 millimeter screw in female patients. And the advantage is it's a versatile technique. You can do a reposition, which is important when you have patients with fractures, you are uh, creating a stable construct. Um, the disadvantages, especially in the early publications, are the complication rates and uh, especially the wound healing problems and screw prominences. But uh, we come a long way uh, when it comes to the screw prominences. We were able to address that a problem by redressing the screw head and lower the rates um, at that point. And especially when it comes to wound tailing problems, when you see uh, newer uh, publications like this one from Nguyen from 2019, describing 260 patients, adult patients in adult deformity surgery, they are describing wound healing rates about two to 7%. And the older publications are describing um, complication rates above 20%. A newer technique is the S2AI technique, which has been introduced in 2007. It's basically a modification of the traditional iliac screw fixation technique with a starting point in the sacral ala uh, between S2 and S1, as you see here on the picture. Um, it has the advantage that you have an easy accessible insertion point. You can provide an inline fixation without the use of, uh, without the needs to use of set connectors, you traverse free cortices, which give you a prompt uh, purchase. The disadvantage is you traverse or transverse the SI joint, and nobody knows at that time if that leads to, uh, to a degeneration in the SI joint, which might lead to pain. Uh, so there are like a couple of um, a couple of manuscripts in the literature. Some are saying that it leads to a degeneration. The others say it doesn't. So uh, we are not clearly on that right now. And one major disadvantage, in my opinion, is you can't use it in patients with psychofracture because you don't have a stable entry point. Um, furthermore, you have to take all the neurovascular structures into uh, consideration when you use that technique. As you see here, a AI screw with a, a, dr a drilled out uh, cortical bone, you see the, the close relation to the superior gluteal artery. Another technique, uh, minimal invasive, would be the iliosacral screw. And um, the advantage is um, and due to the minimal invasive nature, you have very low complication rates. You can easily use it in geriatric patients, even uh, especially when you have non or minimal displaced fractures. The disadvantage is you cannot use it in high grade instabilities, 
Uh, nor you can uh, use it in, neuro in patients with neurologic deficits. Furthermore, especially when you have patients with uh, dysmorphic sacrum, as you see here, uh, you have high rates of screw malpositioning, like easily over 20%. And when you have uh, situations where you have screw loosening or you have, want to uh, fuse long constructs, you have patients with severe osteoporosis, high-grade deformity corrections, you resect a large sacral tumor, have a huge bony destruction of the, uh, of the sacrum, or patients with spinal pelvic dissociation, you might need a dual or multiple iliac screw construct and uh, which leads uh, to a higher stability, a higher stiffness, uh, and stiffness and lower rates of screw loosening. As we know from Schultau et al, the gold standard for the first iliac screw is the trajectory from PSIS to AIS. But no one uh, answered the question what might be the second best trajectory or the best trajectory for the second iliac screw. So because basically you could start anywhere at the posterior pelvic ring or the posterior il iliac crest. We took that question and analyzed five different trajectories, as you can see here on that uh, bone. And uh, we analyzed uh, these trajectories using a CT scan in order to see the maximum length and the intercortical width. And furthermore, we measured and compared the cortical thickness at the PSIS and at the starting point of uh, T2. And our results showed that T2 was the second longest bony canal with a starting point between the PSIS and the PIS towards the AIS. And it showed a good intercortical width and a still acceptable distance to the next arrow area. And the measurement of the cortical thickness at the starting point shows that this starting point has even a thicker cortical bone than the uh, posterior superior leg spine. So furthermore, when you see that picture, you see that thin part um, in uh, the iliac wing, and you see the greater sciatic notch, you want to avoid those two areas, and those are the areas you can always see uh, in the CT scan here, in the axial CT scan, and have these areas have already been described by Hennigo et al., and my friend Alex took that opportunity and uh, measured that and he was able to show that this area is that thin, like we are talking about uh, 0.1 millimeter. So when it comes to dual or multiple iliac screws, T1 is still the gold standard as described by Schulte et al. T3, the trajectory three is very close to that thin part of the ilium. And T4 is very close to the greater sciatic notch. And which means for us, T2 um, has the second longest bony canal. It has a comparable intercortical width like trajectory one and even a, a higher cortical thickness. So from an anatomical perspective, the combination of from T1 and T2 could be the optimal choice for such a multiple iliac screw construct. But there are a lot of limitations. There are no real biomechanical and uh, clinical results uh, available at that time. So we have to work on this. And if you put want to put everything into a flow chart, that might be a way to do it. So in my opinion, you need all those techniques and, um, but you have to uh, make sure that you use the uh, technique for the right patients and the right indication. So in my opinion, when, when it comes to the literature, uh, the S2AI screw might be the better option when you operate on deformities or uh, degenerative spinal disorders. When it comes to uh, infections, which leads to bony destruction or huge tumors, you might uh, choose uh, the lumopelvic fixation also in revision cases. When you have revision cases with uh, high-grade instabilities, you might even uh, use two or more iliac um, screws. When it comes to fractures, um, the lumopelvic fixation is the way to do it because you cannot use the S2AI screw. 
And um, one major uh, interesting topic are the non or minimal displaced fractures without neurological deficits. And uh, this might be, um, uh, might be something for an iliosacral screw. And I think that's my, in my opinion, our future outlook, our biggest challenge, uh, the geriatric population. We know we have a higher mortality, higher morbidity, higher complication rates, higher readmission rates, and a worse outcome in those patients. And my friend from Tel Aviv, who was a fellow uh, at SNI as well, Ron Bletcher, did a nice uh, research study on this using the um, the Washington State Discharge Database, he was able to show that the numbers of lumbar fractures and especially the numbers of sacral fractures in the octogenarians are rising. So there's a need to address and treat those patients well. And, and the question is, do we have experience with that? And when you look at the literature and that's like the assessed date is today. So that's something I did today. There's not that much in the literature, more than these two studies, but um, there's um, actually very little literature, very little evidence for that ongoing increasing problem. So there's one uh, study from uh, Obidadal, and uh, they analyzed uh, sacral fragility fractures uh, in, um, in a, a treated with minimal invasive um, uh, sacral iliosacral screws. They did a bilateral mini open approach. They described two complications, one hardware dislocation and one wound healing problem and two plumulias, but like very small call, a cohort with only 13 patients. There's a review by uh, the German colleague Osterhoff and he stated that uh, the geriatric sacral uh, fractures are really a different entity, especially the octogenarians. And we have limited knowledge and we don't have any validated outcome score for these kinds of patients. So, and one study from SNI uh, did by Alexander von Grinsky, he analyzed the uh, complication rates and mortality in octogenarians uh, undergoing lumopelvic fixations. And he did a retrospective cord analyze, and he was able to include 14 octogenarians with an average age of 83 years. And he had a control group of with 12 patients and their average age was uh, 47 years. So the indications were deformity, non-unions, fracture infection, and tumor. And as you might expect, uh, expect the octogenarians were signif uh, significantly um, uh, um, um, uh, I had a significantly higher morbidity and uh, the Hounsville unit showed that their bone structure was significantly worse. When it comes to major complications, we had more major complications in the octogenarian group. And uh, when you look at those um, complications which required revision surgery, there were three which might lead to the uh, to the effect that their bone quality was uh, much worse than in the control group. So because the Hounsville units showed us basically that there's an abnormal bone structure in the octogenarians. And when you look at the mortality, no, uh, no patient died in a comparison group, two patient died uh, in the octogenarian group, one with a heart failure and one uh, with an intracranial hemorrhage. So this was not associated to uh, the surgery, but uh, as we know from the Charleston comorbidity index, the patients are significantly higher uh, morbid. So, and as we know from this large database analyzed from Purman and all, I think it was the NIS database, and he could show that the mortality is increasing with age in this group of patients who underwent lumbar spine surgery. So, the results show that that operat operative treatment of very old patients remains a, a major challenge, and you should better expect high rates of complications and mortality. The question is, what is the options? And um, I think one option is the iliosacral screw fixation. And uh, when you look at the data that are available, 
uh, who compare the iliosacral school with the spinal pelvic fixation in geriatric sacral fractures. There are like two or three studies. This one here from Mendel et al. analyzing 61 patients with a bilateral or sacral fracture and average age was 80 years and follow up at discharge and six months. And they could show a significant improvement in the outcome in both groups. But um, a problem that appears to be in like a lot of studies is um, something that could my colleague Katharina Wedding show as well. We analyzed bilateral uh, sacral fractures in um, a geriatric patient group. And as you can see, 48 patients underwent iliosacral screw placement and 29 lumopelvic fixation. And we could show that with the iliosacral screw, you have a much lower OR time and also a lower length of stay comparable to those patients with a lumopelvic fixation. But when you look at the SEP analysis, we had 14 patients with a C3 fracture, which is basically a spinal pelvic, pelvic instability. And none of those patients underwent iliosacral screw placement. They all got a lumbopelvic fixation. So even though all the patients might look the same, they are not. You're basically comparing um, apples to pears, as we say in Germany, or apples to orange, as we say in the States. When you look at the uh, complications, that's like expected results. Uh, we have a higher complication rates when it comes to infections in the lumopelvic fixation group. And on the other hand, we have a higher rate of screw malpositioning in the iliosacral screw group. So what we did as well is look at the functional outcome of um, patients who underwent lumopelvic fixation using the SMFA score. And something that we were able to point out there is that the older patients, the, the, they even though they suffer from a low energy trauma like ground level fall, they have a higher rate of impairment. So, and I think it's like um, the colleague Spiegel said, to, in order to treat those geriatric patients well, we need minimal invasive therapeutic strategies. So in my opinion, the key points are, pelvic fixation is a dynamic evolving concept. Uh, we were able to improve uh, the outcome and lower the complication rates. You have to select the right technique for the right patient and the right indication. And in my opinion, the future outlook is the biggest challenge is the treatment of the growing geriatric population. And uh, we need minimal, uh, minimal invasive concepts, especially for the high grade instabilities um, on, and uh, otherwise we are not able to treat those patients well. And I want to thank for your, thank you for your attention and use this opportunity to say thank you to all the uh, guys at SSF and SNI. I had an incredible, unbelievable time. I met so many great, inspiring and lovely people. And they, those, those are like only a few pictures of my really great time in Seattle. And special thanks to Dr. Chapman to keep my boss in Germany posted if I show uh, some room for improvement. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. So a um, couple of questions. First of all, congratulations on your work. And I, I can see how they had no problems uh, pointing you to Pravato and uh, you have accumulated a great uh, deal of knowledge. And just want you to know, we were at a recent meeting um, in Las Vegas, um, OSET, OSET, uh, Orthopedic Summit, and uh, at our spine meetings there, totally unpromoted, Dr. David uh, Pauly uh, from Minnesota commented on your work and your expertise. So you're the most quoted person in uh, his talks about how to optimize uh, pelvic fixation. I, I thought that was very cool. Uh, so first of all, you said that um, geriatric fractures don't fit into the regular classification systems. I saw you quoted a paper by Klaus Schnake. He presented at our recent spine trauma meeting in December. And uh, he suggested, Klaus Schnake suggested that we need a separate classification system for older people. Is that your thought as well? 
I think he's right because when you look at the classification system of the AO, it basically ne neglects the anterior pelvic ring. And like the sacral fractures in geriatric patients are all like uh, in most of the cases combined with a pelvic ring fracture. So I think uh, I think it's the better way to um, have a separate geriatric classification for sacral fractures. So I have a question for Dr. Glenn David. You mentioned you wanted less invasive strategies uh, for geriatric sacral fractures. Glenn David is a national, internationally, as you know, recognized uh, interventionalist, and he does sacroplasties. I'll uh, ask him what his opinion is first, and then have you give a repartee. So sacroplasties, when would you do them, and what has your experience been with those? Yeah, uh, as you know, we had to be seen a lot of patients with uh, these sacral interdeficiency fractures, uh, and patients... When we actually, uh, is it on here? There's a chair. No, the okay. chair is in front of you. When we actually uh, are uh, cementing the, uh, the sacral ala area, I uh, had some good success of, uh, of having good relief of their uh, pain in these, from, this, from the fractures in these areas. Uh, although, unfortunately, not able to put in any other areas, but putting it in the uh, sacral ala area uh, is giving us uh, a lot of good results of. Uh, helping uh, get the pain under control. So basically, most of these geriatric fractures, Emery, correct me if uh, you disagree, uh, as I know you will, are so-called H or U-shaped fractures, meaning they're two vertical components to the sacral ala, and then there's either continuity down into the sacral notch, or it, but somewhere it crosses a transversely over through the sacral bodies. So you're putting in cement just into the sacral ala, That's not correct. into the main transverse fracture. Is that right? That's correct. How many cc's do you usually put in there? Approximately about uh, four to five cc's approximately. Emre, why would this work? How can this biomechanically make a difference? I mean, it's like when you, when you see, and that is something... Um, you see on a CT scan, like the Hounsfield units are like basically shown you have an abnormal bone structure. And sometimes like there in some nice anatomical studies basically shown in the sacral area, you don't have any bone there left. You only have the, basically the, the cortical, um, um, like very thin parts, but the, the inside is basically empty. So I, I, I understand why this works. And when it comes to pain relief, I mean, as you know, we are always afraid of cement leakage and we always, uh, like at least in our hospital, we do more sacroplasties like over the last two or three years, but we are talking about like two or three a year maybe. So that's not our experience. We're always afraid about cement leakage and especially when you have like uh, patients with, like old patients with a trauma, they could always have... Uh, um, uh, impaired tissue. So you are, even though the, the rates of wound healing problems and that cord are like really low, but you are very afraid of that. And that's why we don't use that that much. But I know there are like more and more studies coming out. I know there was a systematic review coming out in 2019 and like 18 studies, more than 600 patients. They're showing good results for the sacroplasty. So I think that's an ongoing debate and maybe we are changing our paradigm. Question to Glenn, whilst we have Emery here, how displaced can these fractures be that you're still comfortable doing a sacroplasty? Well, as, as uh, we said, we, we stick to mainly the uh, sacral ala region uh, in these areas where if you guys are thinking the orthopedic and, and neurosurgery spine uh, surgeons deeming me as, as unstable, we kind of tend to stay away from those types of fractures. Uh, any transverse fractures, any uh, significant displacement, uh, we're staying away from those. But Mainly ones that have and include uh, the sacral ala fracture, uh, having you know very good results with with getting cement into that area. Uh, can you put screws into a uh, like uh, SI screws into a patient who's had sacroplasties? Does that somehow preclude later surgery, or do you have to do a, a lumbar pelvic fixation and with screws into the ilium if you had a patient with sacroplasties? Does it preclude surgery? In other words. Uh, it probably does um, because like you, you would be afraid of um, like destroying the bone or uh, like of a displacement. So I don't think you would do that. Probably you can, 
Um, I, I haven't done it before. I don't know if you did it, um, but like I, I think if the idiosacral screw is not working off, you would always switch to a more stable construct like the Loma pelvic fixation. Great. Uh, final question from my end. So thanks, Glenn. Sorry, I pulled you back. You have to run I, back. I have a question for Dr. Glenn. Oh, yeah. So if you have patients with sacral fractures, like in, in, in the region of the sacral area, what, what are you doing if they have an additional fracture in the anterior pelvic ring? In its anterior pelvic, I didn't hear the last part. Exactly. What, what, what do you do when you have like an additional fracture in the anterior pelvic ring? So the superior yeah. pubic rami. Yeah, so if the scenario, you know, think it's unstable and, and uh, you know, we probably definitely just kind of stick to the sacral aileite region. Uh, in those cases, if the ring was unstable, you know, we probably would stay away from that and, and making sure that uh, it was stable, first of all, uh, and making sure that our sexual colleagues uh, would have a look at that. Okay. Because we always fix it. Like, we are going with the Romans classification for the fragility fractures of the pelvis. And yeah. if you have, like, a patient with a Dennis one a sacral fracture in, uh, in the region of the sacral alia, in addition to the uh, non-displaced anterior pelvic ring fracture, you you might use uh, you might like let the patient mobilize and see if uh, pain-wise if it's working out if he's able to mobilize. Otherwise, you have to uh, basically fix both the I posterior see. and the anterior part. Uh, okay. Great presentation, great work. Emre, it's fantastic to see you. Um, congratulations again and stay in touch and stay safe. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you, Ben. Uh, one more.